This is actually my um, 11th year directing Penn. Uh, for those of you who maybe here just joining us, Clarissa made an announcement earlier. She's going to control everyone's uh, mute and unmute. If you have questions, uh, we're going to address those at the end, but you can share those in a chat. Um, there's also a kind of raise your hand feature that you can use as well, at the, again, at the end of the presentation. Um, this is the 48th consecutive um, year of the Preservation Institute in Puckett. It is um, the nation's oldest continually operating program for historic preservation. It's an experiential learning program. When I say continually operating, we may have to put an asterisk by <laughs> Uh, 2020, or the whole world will have to put an asterisk by 2020. We have a couple of uh, researchers have joined me here on the but most of our students this year are working remotely. We've had nearly uh, 750 participants in the program in 48 years, 35% um, of which are University of Florida. The rest have joined from over 130 institutions domestically and internationally. This year, because of the pandemic, we are wor working remotely. And we only have six students, all University of Florida, who participated in the program, but they were also joined by six researchers as well, which I'll describe. I just wanted everyone to make a note. I know we're two years out or a little under two years out from the uh, anniversary, 50th anniversary, but I want you to mark your calendars for October 7th through the night, 2022, will be the celebration on Nantucket. Um, Interestingly enough, the first studies that were done by the Preservation Institute in Nantucket weren't looking at individual buildings or monuments, but were actually neighborhood and streetscape studies that looked holistically at the historic built environment. The gentleman in the photo before, that's Blair Reeves and his wife Mary Nell on the left, and Walter Beinecke Jr. They're the founders of our program. And I always describe them as sort of kindred spirits, and I think one of the things that united them was their holistic thinking and the way they approached the built environment. Because of the work that we did in looking um, more broadly at um, neighborhoods and streetscapes, the Historic American Building Survey actually updated and changed their guidelines based on the work here, at, here on uh, Nantucket. Over the last two years, we've undertaken a rather ambitious uh, study that we call Resilient Nantucket. We digitally documented downtown from Brant Point through what's our study area that we'll talk about today, the South Washington Street area. Over 300 buildings were assessed. Uh, sea level rise was modeled both digitally and visualized using this data and vulnerability assessment um, uh, undertaken. The, um, some of the outcomes from the last two years, we did a, a Keeping History Above Water workshop that had 150 people from both on and off island who attended last year to look at this issue of resilience through the lens of historic preservation. Among the recommendations that Preservation Institute Nantucket made was the creation of an umbrella program that we named Acclimate. Students gave it that name, ACK being the airport code. So now we have about 14 organizations who are meeting uh, about every six weeks. They come together to coordinate their efforts around resilience. This is being funded by the Osceola Foundation, the Walter Beinecke Jr. family. As part of our um, Keeping History Above Water workshop last year, our keynote speaker, Jeff Goodell, who's a journalist and an editor at Rolling Stones with nearly 30 years experience in covering climate change and resilience, He's produced, he's published a number of books, including the latest one, The Water Will Come. At the end of his talk last year, he posed some rather large questions that are facing us both here on Nantucket as well as the world in general around this issue of sea level rise. And he basically asked what will be saved, who's going to make these decisions, and how are we going to pay for it? So we use that as sort of a stepping off point um, to begin to look at a specific area of downtown Nantucket. The other thing that we are looking at rather closely is this idea, which has taken a sort of foothold in Europe, the idea of cultural heritage regeneration. We're going to say resilience a lot today, but I like this term regeneration because I think it puts at the forefront the idea of resilience. It's not just returning to a norm, but actually hoping, hopefully after a storm event, for example, and you're recovering uh, a place like Nantucket, you're actually making it better and stronger than it was before. I think we've all heard that the real 
there is no new norm. And I think regeneration kind of puts that at the forefront. The quote that I like from the Cultural Heritage Finance Alliance is that in the world that is being born of the pandemic and against the background of looming climate crisis, the regeneration of cultural heritage stands at the center of a spectrum of human needs. These range from the most basic, such as house, housing, gathering places, and workplace to sites of identity, community, and deeper psychic connection. And at this intersection, cultural heritage regeneration can play a critical role in creating the built environment that humanity needs. So as many of you who know me have heard me say many times, historic preservation is not about freezing things in time. It's about managing change and doing it in a way that engages stakeholders and really helps understand the values associated with the place. And that's the hallmark of the Preservation Institute in Nantucket. Sorry, I'm having a little technical issue here. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about regenerative heritage, but happy to share with you if you have questions or even offline. But at the forefront of regenerative heritage is this idea of placemaking, uh, memory and identity, collective memory and identity, authentic human attachments and belongings to a place. Again, going back to that holistic understanding of an environment, history and tradition. So it's not just the tangible, but the intangible aspects of an environment and heritage as a driver and enabler of sustainable development. We're gonna give you a brief overview today. We're gonna to talk then about historical development of our study area, cultural landscape approach, the built and natural environment assessments, our vulnerability um, analysis, our initial concepts for resilience and adaptation area strategy. And we're gonna end with the demonstration projects and talk briefly about next steps. It was a little different program this year besides being uh, mostly remote. We had three design teams, uh, the natural environment who is led by my colleague, uh, Mike Volk, who's a licensed landscape architect and, um, and uh, faculty at the University of Florida's College of Design, Construction and Planning. Interestingly enough, uh, Bob Miklos, who I can't thank enough for his involvement, he volunteered his time and his firm was involved, design lab based out of Boston, an award-winning design firm that does educational and uh, cultural institutions. And they were, he led their architecture built environment team. And then we had our urban environment team. So again, six students, but they were all paired with six different researchers or kind of team leaders. I should also give a huge thank you to Remain Nantucket and the Schmidt Family Foundation, who also um, is helping uh, fund our project, which will continue beyond the summer into uh, the fall and into the first of the year. We had a lot of advisors. I won't name them all, but we, it was an amazing group of people. The town was very engaged. Um, Nantucket Conservation Foundation, the Land Bank, um, the Linda Lauren Nature Foundation. I can't thank everyone enough for um, giving of their time so generously. And this was really, in general, a team effort. So the project that we're going to talk about today is the South Washington Street, or we've named it the South Washington Street Study Area, which includes um, that area, it's the southern end of town, and it also includes the creeks. Our area is over 140 acres, almost equally divided between this large uh, saltwater marsh known as the creeks, as well as um, what we're calling the urban environment. There are about 180 buildings in our study area, nearly 4,000 feet of shoreline. We did a quick assessment just using property value, uh, the property appraisers uh, assessment, and you can see it's uh, nearly $315 million. Uh, the parcels on average are about $2 million. That excludes the town pier and the Great Harbor Yacht Club, which are each more valued at more than $25 million, given their connection to the water. And we had um, uh, five different property types that we assessed in our neighborhood. Our goal was to document and assess the cultural landscape of the South and Washington Street area of Nantucket Town and to develop a resilience and adaptation strategy and a demonstration project that responds to coastal hazards. We specifically address tidal flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise. 
We're proposing, in terms of a framework, this idea of a resilience and adaptation areas. It's somewhat inspired by a program in the state of Florida that were called Adaptation Action Zones. So it might be areas where there could be financial incentive and other incentives that would encourage kind of development or redevelopment through the lens of resilience. So again, rather than property by property, we're looking at uh, larger areas and we're defining these areas based on the coastal hazards or threats of a specific location, the natural geographic features, looking at the history and origins and development of the area, and the cultural landscape, both intangible and intangible. Um, we've identified three uh, main areas, resilience areas in uh, Nantucket Town. It's the Brent Point and Jetty's Beach area to about the Whaling Museum and the Nantucket Yacht Club. It's the historic commercial core of Nantucket and all of the historic wharves. And then it's the Washington Street and the Creeks study area. And this is just a zoomed in shot to show you. We're, we're going from Coffin Street, and for those of you who've been at the Penn Cottages are right off Coffin, we're in the study area. It's Commercial Street, Harbor, about 80 acres of the creeks, and then the other boundary here is Union Street. And if those of you who are familiar with Nantucket know there's a very distinct elevation change there between Union and uh, Orange Street. We looked at a lot, a lot of codes <laughs> and policies and guidelines. And so we were trying to reference those throughout. And I think part of our, uh, part of our uh, goal going forward will be to go back to these policies and guidelines and see where we very closely are adhering to them and where we might be suggesting sort of policy changes. Some of the principles that we used in developing this project, we did our best given the pandemic situation to collaborate with a wide array of stakeholders as possible. We engage a range of experts, both from on and off the island. We had over 12 presentations, ranging from private firms to, um, to the National Park Service. Uh, we employed best practices uh, for addressing coastal uh, resilience. We addressed a range of environmental dynamics um, and coastal hazards, but again, our focus was on the flooding issue, not so much subsidence and other, other coastal hazards like erosion. We utilized existing studies, reports, and data. We did consider policies, regulations, and guidelines. And we did utilize a holistic cultural landscape and systems approach to inform the assessment, resilience, and adaptation strategy for the study area. We had to put some parameters. This was a six-week program. <laughs> so you, everything that you're seeing here was developed. We did some research, obviously, prior. But a lot of the proposals and ideas came over the last few weeks. Um, we did not look at, I have said before, and I'll say it again, I'm not a civil engineer, and we did not look at large-scale town or island-wide civil engineering interventions, uh, such as maybe floodgates at the harbor. We also didn't look at that because we don't feel maybe that that's the most appropriate approach, that we're gonna have to, as the Dutch say, learn to live with water. So we took a more kind of architectural <laughs> scale approach. Um, hydrolog hydro hydrological, geotechnical, and other investigations and studies were not done, but they'll be part of our recommendations. Considerations for adaptation are general in nature, with modifications to specific landscapes and buildings requiring further investigation. We didn't really look at the economic impacts other than to understand, again, using simple property appraiser data, how much land value we were talking about. The vulnerability assessment focuses again on flooding and we use the NOAA intermediate high projections, which is what the resilient Nantucket visualizations were based on. And that was uh, agreed upon approved by the town of Nantucket. And again, other further study will include looks at erosion and subsidence as well as other coastal hazards. The big elephant in the room that we made an assumption about was the steamship authority. So we recognize that the steamship authority is either gonna have to be uh, relocated from its current location or significantly modified if it's to remain. We certainly did look at the circulation routes to our area, Washington Street being a primary vehicular uh, traffic route through town to Mid-Island, um, but we did make the assumption that the Steamship Authority will be relocated or modified and Washington Street will go away at some point. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Madeline. Hello, um, I'm Elena Jackson, and I'm a student in UF's Historic Preservation Program. 
I'm going to be covering the history of the development within our study area. I don't have control to, to pass it on. Oh, thanks. All right, so during the original platting of Nantucket Town, the land was split into 27 equal shares, and each division, um, subsequent division, was also into 27 shares. This map is showing those divisions. Our study area in particular was platted in 1805, which is much later than the original lots in 1717. The timeframes for our timeline that we selected are based on island-wide historic events, and I'll specify those as we examine the development during each of the periods. Our study area has had many different types of use, from being involved to whaling, to art, um, recreation, conservation. It's a really complex and dynamic area, and there are many layers to its history. This slide is showing the development of the roads. In 1834, the furthest left, you can clearly see Washington Street and Union Street. There is also what's labeled as rope walk, spanning between the two. Historically, a rope walk is a long, straight area where rope was made. The 1894 map shows the railroad in pink, which was built in 1881 and ran until 1917. There's an 1858 map, which is not pictured here, and that's the first map that we see the transverse streets of Coffin, Fayette, Meter, and Francis. By 1949, um, Washington Street extends further, and then in 1985 and after, um, that's when we see Salt Marsh Way added, and then Mariner Way and the bike path in 2017. Union Street remains pretty consistent throughout. This um, slide is showing the changes to the boundaries of the creeks. It is not showing changes in the hydrology, only the extent, which is indicated by the dashed line. And the boundaries we have are based off of the overlays with these specific historic maps and USGS maps. Um, Pre-1846, um, most of the development within our study area is along Union Street. Um, you can see from the historic map on the right that there are buildings along Washington Street, but few that survive today. This time period was selected from after the 1846 fire until the railroad closes in 1917. Overall, there are less buildings along Washington Street than we saw in the previous historic map. Most of the development is still occurring along Union Street and some along Fayette Street. And one thing to mention is how dynamic this area is in the historic maps. I'm going to expand on this later, but buildings come and go frequently. And during this period, almost 20% of the total structures are removed, mostly along Union Street abutting the creeks, and then a couple moved on Meter and um, Coffin Streets. This is from 1881. It's titled Bird's Eye View of the Town of Nantucket, and we're going to zoom in on our study area, but it's providing the same info as the maps. Um, there are a few buildings, and they're primarily along Union Street and Fayette Street. This uh, image from the 1870s is looking towards Washington Street and the creeks, and you can see there's large lots um, with a lot of open space, large yards. This 1890s photo is showing modest fishing shacks along South Beach. I think this characterizes both the architecture as well as um, the proximity to the marsh and the coast. You can really see the vegetation here. This from 1915 was taken from Orange Street and you can see the train and the small cottages along Washington Street. This image is a closer look at the train and the berm that it was constructed upon. And even after the train is removed during World War I, that berm remains and is now the basis for the bike path. 
The development that occurred between 1918 and 1955 is shown in green here. And this time frame correlates to the removal of the railroad until Nantucket's local landmark historic district. And during this time, we see much more development along Washington Street, as well as Meter and Francis Streets. And during the latter part of this time frame is when we begin to see infill and building on areas that had previously been marsh. Approximately 16% of the total structures are removed during this time, mostly small shacks directly on the waterfront. This is a 1926 aerial. Note uh, the clusters of buildings along Washington Street with large open spaces between Washington and Union, and also see how the creeks, um, how far they extend into our study area. This is a 1926 shot of the Nantucket shipyard. And again, you can see the creeks and marsh running behind it and how few buildings are, are around it. And this site will later become the Great Harbor Yacht Club. This 1930s image was taken um, from Commercial Wharf looking towards Washington Street and the shipyard. This image, um, it was also taken from Orange Street. That large open area towards the left will later be developed. And I believe the house in the middle there that is covered with ivy is 26 Union Street. This is a 1940s shot from the shipyard looking towards Commercial Wharf. Here it's important to note the bulkheads, um, which make this area more buildable. And also buildings are no longer as close to the shoreline as they had been in some of the earlier photographs. This is um, Washington Street after a snowstorm in the 1940s. And you can just see the character of Washington Street at this time. Here, the development, the new development is shown in yellow. This time range includes when the downtown was listed on the National Register, and it ends in 1975 when the entire island becomes a National Historic Landmark District. There's new construction throughout our study area. Two clusters though, one is close to the wharf along Commercial Streets and the other is close to the creeks and shipyard area. And the aerials on the right um, show how the area is starting to increase in density. And the inset image is from 1968, showing the parking lot under construction. This is a 1950s view of the shipyard. Again, this is today the Great Harbor Yacht Club. And it is still bordered um, to the west and south by marsh. This 1968 aerial is a closer look at Coffin, Washington, and Commercial Street areas. The bottom middle area that's lighter in color will become the parking lot. And here you can see um, pin cottages and, and some other buildings that we'll talk about later. This is another 1968 aerial, which has been cropped to fit our study area. And sections of Washington are developed and we're starting to see it get more dense, but there's still large um, sections, especially towards the creeks, that are still marshy and undeveloped. This time, um, the new development is depicted in pink, and it ranges from national landmark designation until 1986. During this time, there's mostly random infill and the construction of the town pier. There's less development overall, but this is a comparatively short time frame with only 13 new structures added. And then after 1987, excuse me, this is the recent development. In 1987, Nantucket's zoning ordinance is changed. And here we see the bulk of new construction is very close to the coast along Washington Street. Um, the number of structures by this point has almost doubled since 1955. This image is side by side of a 1992 shot with one from 
yesterday <laughs> and it's on Union Street and it's to show how the character has been more stable. The street was developed earlier and more densely, so overall it has experienced less change. This summary here um, has a graph showing how many of the structures that still stand were built in each time period. The period with the most is after 1987, followed by between 1918 and 1955. The smaller graphs show how there were buildings that were both built and demolished within the one time period. So the one between 1847 and 1917, there were 36% of structures built and demolished in that period and then 33% for the 33 for the next um, time frame. Overall, before 1955, there's approximately 25% of, of the structures being either demolished or relocated. I was unable to make similar graphs for after 1955 because there are just no known building maps, so I can't easily get numbers for the demolitions and relocations. This uh, slide is showing how the shipyard, later the Great Harbor Yacht Club, has evolved throughout time with the waterfront. And the character as a whole goes from being a working waterfront with shipyard and fishing cottages to being a very residential and recreational area. And the marsh has been infilled and developed and the density has greatly increased. This is a present day current zoning map and our study area is zoned for many different types of use. And now I'll pass it to Madeline. Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Madeline. I'm a fourth year undergraduate studying psychology and anthropology and I will be covering the cultural landscape approach with regards to the Washington Street study area. So what is a cultural landscape and how are we defining it? A cultural landscape, according to the National Park Service, is a geographic area including both cultural and natural resources and the wildlife or domestic animals therein, associated with a historic event, activity, or person, or exhibiting other cultural or aesthetic values. So there are four general types of cultural landscapes, but they're not mutually exclusive. There is the historic vernacular landscape, historic design landscape, historic sites, and ethnographic landscapes. And so the spatial organization, buildings and structures, view sheds, and cultural traditions all come together to determine this cultural landscape for Nantucket. So a cultural landscape assessment is conducted with the aim to provide planners with an overview of the landscape and evaluate treatment methods um, as active, changing, and community-driven practices. So in establishing these significant facets that contribute to the cultural landscape, we're better able to prepare for um, strategies for documentation, interpretation, maintenance, and adaption for these certain endangered features. And so a successful cultural landscape assessment would include these eight research and evaluation springboards. And in the scope of the study of Washington Street, a few of these have been identified. So here is our working statement of significance and integrity, which is an integral part of a cultural landscape survey or assessment. So in general, our statement emphasizes this larger transformation of the town from a industrial to recreational focus. And with regards to aspects of integrity outlined by the National Park Service, uh, we would need to carefully uh, consider these in, in light of any kind of recommendation strategy. And those are location, setting, design, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association. And South Washington Street is this amalgamation of various different periods of Nantucket history. And while somewhat from fragmented, it still tells the story of adaptive use and social and economic resilience. So the Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties outlined four main treatment methods for the preservation of historic sites, which range from the least invasive preservation to the most invasive reconstruction. And rehabilitation, while not the least invasive, does allow for changes um, in use while still protecting the site's historic character. So these uh, Secretary of Interior Standards recognizes that resilience to natural hazards is important to uh, is an important component to um, rehabilitation and is often recommended as a part of resilience projects and these critical activities uh, that take place prior to intervention 
have informed and been informed by the cultural landscape approach and have infused this strategy with a greater focus on community engagement, uh, values assessments, documentation practices that include both the tangible and intangible aspects of heritage. In general, when viewing resiliency through the lens of the cultural landscape, uh, we're better able to see this interaction between nature and human activities, uh, as well as observe patterns of land use that could inform uh, context specific design strategies. It also provides cultural and historic context to adoption plans. So we can look at how a uh, community has already exercised environmental resilience and see how it can inform current and future intervention schemes. With this comes a greater consideration for the origin of landscape change and, and makes it for a more inclusive management strategy. Nantucket is an island with multiple different identities. It's been created by a combination of social, natural, and built environments. The human interaction with the natural landscape along Washington Street has continuously evolved. So it first serving as a whaling shop depot, a fishing community, a transportation hub, and then finally the cradle for the Nantucket's artist movement. So artists have been documenting a changing Nantucket since the 19th century, um, and they've contributed greatly to interest of tourists in this area to the present day. And with the help of the Artists Association, um, Nantucket's heritage of plein air and sidewalk art shows have been revived in its extant environment. And here we have a condensed timeline of the visual arts movement along South Washington Street. And just a few key takeaways are the readaptive use of old fishing shacks um, as artist studios by Florence Lang. And like I said, the revival of this plein air tradition um, in the annual festival just a few years ago. To expand briefly on that timeline, it's not until the 1920s that Nantucket's art scene is termed a colony. And the once dilapidated Washington Street fishing shacks were transformed into these studio spaces for rent during the summer months. And by the 1940s, there is this cultural space that's been firmly established in Washington Street area. And um, especially with the founding of the Kerr School of Art, 33 Washington Street in the early 1950s. And despite the conclusion of this golden age um, in the latter half of the 1950s, there is um, this visual arts expression has continued to live on in not only the steady growth of the Artists Association, but the creation of the Nantucket Island School of Design and Art. And um, NISTA continues this tradition of artists occupying these, uh, these cottages at their 71 Washington Street property. However, the biggest challenge that um, they continue to face with the use of these properties is the nuisance and major storm event flooding and the future of this heritage is unknown based on that. Here we have outlined the key locations associated with visual arts, um, particularly taking note of traditional Nantucket crafts represented by the Lightship Basket Museum um, and the location of the Artists Association just outside of our study area at 19 Washington Street. Here we have a few principal paintings of our study area uh, along Washington Street, the creeks, and what was known as South Beach. Um, seeing this area from an artist's perspective can give us a better understanding of not only how a particular area looked um, at a time in history, but how the artists themselves had, you know, imagined their landscape. It also provides us distinct clues to the evolution of the area and perhaps how we can reimagine it in the future. As mentioned before, in a cultural landscape assessment, it's important to engage um, our community and stakeholders. And in order to achieve this goal, a test survey was conducted using Acclimate social media followers with questions um, inspired by a similar survey conducted on Martha's Vineyard. So we had 22 participants, which they were required to rank 14 sites along Washington Street for both visual appeal and how greatly they represented Nantucket character. And to inform future surveys of the area, we also asked this last question to see if we missed any important sites. Here we have a comprehensive uh, results from the first type of questions. You can see that the, uh, the creeks ranked highest in visual appeal, while you can see that the municipal parking lot ranked the lowest. And here are the uh, comprehensive result for the second line of questioning. And again, you can see that the creeks ranked highest and the municipal parking lot the lowest. 
And here's just an easier way to examine the top five locations from each style um, of questioning. So from this data, we can gather that there are some areas we should look further into, you know, preserving the natural and architectural view sheds for visitors and residents, and others where essential infrastructure could be maintained, uh, but their character and functionality could be improved by aesthetic changes. We have pinpointed these four uh, view sheds identified as, uh, as representing Nantucket character greatly. And with the exclusion of the physical location of Union Street, they all represent a deep connection to the water. To conclude, the cultural landscape of Washington Street, although might seem fragmented, um, it de demonstrates this dynamic history of Nantucket as a whole. We have this great connection to the land, connection to art and culture, and lastly, and most importantly, this deep association to the water. Um, hi, I'm Inas Tapit, and I'm a recent graduate in Historic Preservation Program from the University of Florida. I'll be discussing about the built environment for the study area. In this section, we identified the building typologies by use, style, and structure. Uh, we also looked at the architecture character of the streets. Um, this is our survey methodology um, for gathering the current conditions data. The University of Florida Historic Preservation Program has been utilizing this technology for a year. It greatly expedites our survey process so we can cover more larger study areas. Last year, during the Preservation Institute 2019 season, we were able to survey 300 buildings in a week. For this project, we created a new platform and included the listed categories in order to collect the most relevant data. Um, one of such category was building condition assessment, which ranks buildings on a scale from good to vacant and is looking at the seven aspects of integrity, which Madeline introduced when talking about the cultural landscape. In the study area, a vast majority are good with a few in fair and poor condition. Um, using that data, this is the building's map by its use. Uh, you can see along the Union Street, um, um, and its transfer streets, Coffin, Fayette, Nieder, and Francis, most of the buildings are residential, whereas along the Washington Street, there is diversity in use. In this street, we can see residential buildings, commercial buildings like retails related to marine sports, commercial institutional buildings like Maria Mitchell Association. Similarly, there are also recreational buildings like Great Harbor Yacht Club and governmental buildings like Town of Nantucket Government, which is purple in color. So here buildings are mapped by styles and Union Street is most identified with the whaling period, whereas Washington Street was later developed, therefore has a broader range of architectural styles, which will be described shortly afterwards. Um, the South Washington extension area has more recent development that spawns to the 21st century than the others. The transfer streets also support the mixture of architecture in the study area as they have both the typical Nanticket architecture and newer architectural styles. Um, this slide shows buildings mapped by structure. We are looking at the system because it will inform the effectiveness of adaptation strategies. We can see that um, most of the buildings in the study area have continuous foundation, which includes both the basement and crawl space. There are also buildings with piers and slab as their foundation, which are marked in orange and purple color in the map, respectively. Um, in our analysis, uh, this is the good, fair, and poor condition that I talked about earlier. Next slide. So in our analysis of the architecture, we looked at the Union Street, Washington Street, and all the streets in between in order to make sure we had a strong understanding of the area's architecture character. So um, the Union Street consists of mostly typical Nantucket federal and revival houses. Revival houses included colonial romantic and green in it. Um, talking about the scale, it is pretty uniform with buildings being mostly two and a half story that you can see in pictures. Um, the architecture also responds to the topography in that um, the houses on the side of the orange street are elevated higher and the houses on the opposite side of the union are at or slightly above grade, but are actually elevated. Um, due to the downslope 
of the area going towards the harbor, this um, harbor. Besides that, the houses have private parking spaces and landscape, mostly gardens at the back of the house. Coffin Street shows the diversity of architectural styles, including one of the few gambrel roof structures on the island, as seen on the 18 Coffin Street. Um, it is also the home of the Preservation Institute Nanticket Cottages, which is the 8 Coffin Street. So, um, Fayette Street emulates the style of union in the use of typical Nanticket houses that have basement or crawl space area that have similar materials to union. Uh, whereas Meader Streets um, also have typical Nanticket houses and they are starting to elevate in response to sea level rise and flooding. Uh, Francis Street, um, the buildings over this street are mostly contemporary and new traditional. Um, in contrast to Union, the buildings are mostly set back from the street and have more visible garden spaces. Lastly, the Washington Street, um, the, this street has diverse uses. However, it is an example of how architecture responds to the needs of the community and shows development periods that we discussed earlier in the presentation by Elena. Um, the Land Bank and the Town of Nanticket have so-called pocket parks and public open spaces for the community to enjoy nature and historic views of the harbor while still being in town. 33 Washington Street is not only the focus of our project, but is also a primary feature on Washington Street. Its history goes back to the artist colony that once called Washington Street home, and now it serves the purpose of connecting people to the natural environment through Maria Mitchell's as association motto of sky, land, and sea. So I'll pass along to Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. I am a fourth year undergraduate studying sustainability in the built environment and urban and regional planning. Our survey methodology includes a field survey, typology, identification and mapping, plant inventory and an existing conditions assessment. This was all done in teamwork with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation, the Land Bank, and the Nature Foundation. With plant inventory, we identified over 100 species. We were able to identify seven landscape typologies as the Washington Street site area is very diverse in landscape. These seven include beaches, saltwater marsh, freshwater marsh, public parks, ponds, public open space and private open space. And all of these typologies will be explained in the next slides. First with the plant inventory, there are over a hundred species of plants within our site area, uh, whether they are native, non-native or invasive. The eight on this slide are some of the most common or most important. The smooth cord grass, American beach grass and swamp rose mallow are all native plants along with the clethora hedge, even though it is typically only used for landscaping. The Japanese knotweed and phragmites are two very common but very invasive species we located within the site area. And hydrangeas and lilies are two non-native species that are very popular for landscaping in residential areas. Our first landscape typology is the saltwater marshes. They are defined as coastal ecosystems in the upper coastal intertidal zone between land and open salt or brackish water that is regularly flooded by tides. This is mostly prevalent in the creeks, which are 80 contiguous acres in the southeast portion of the study area. Uh, the creeks contain primarily saltwater marsh, but also include freshwater marsh, eelgrass beds, and sand berms. Some of the existing conditions at the creeks include the old railroad bed, which has been converted into a bike path. It blocks salt marsh uh, migration and alters the goose pond hydrology, which leads to stormwater and water quality issues. The natural hydrology has been impacted by the 1930s Civilian Conservation Corps effort to attempt to mitigate mosquito populations. Next are freshwater marshes. 
A freshwater marsh is a non-tidal, non-forested marsh wetland that contains freshwater and is continuously or frequently flooded. Uh, freshwater marshes are prevalent across the island. However, there is only one freshwater marsh within the Washington Street Area study. And some of the species we were able to identify within the freshwater marshes are the smooth cord grass, which is the grass that you see in the middle bottom image. And you can also see the invasive Phragmites, which are the reeds in the top right corner next to the fence. There's one pond in our site area known as Goose Pond. Uh, ponds are defined as an area filled with water that may occur naturally as a part of floodplains or as an isolated depression that may be artificially made. Some of the species we were able to identify near Goose Pond were the silver maple tree, which are the light colored trees seen in the background, and the invasive Japanese knotweed is seen growing through the fence. Uh, beaches are present along the coast and the shoreline of our site area and are defined as strips of sand on the shoreline that differ based on estuarine and dune classifications. The estuarine beaches that we see in our site area are beaches where saltwater and freshwater meet and they're often highly vegetated with uh, similar vegetation as a saltwater marsh. Dune beaches include beaches with natural or artificial dune formations that help to protect against wave energy. Uh, two of the popular plant species we identified on the beaches are the American beach grass and the beach rose, which is the uh, shrub you see in the top right corner. It is not flowering yet, however. Uh, the next landscape typology is public parks. There are several public parks located in the South Washington Street study area, and they encourage recreation and provide access to the harbor. Some of these amenities include benches, picnic tables, and bike racks. Uh, these public parks are maintained by both the town of Nantucket and the Nantucket Land Bank. Some are more landscaped than others, and others are left a little more natural. Uh, as you can see, with the difference in paving, the park on the top right corner uses brick paving, and the park in the bottom left hand corner uses shell pathways and some of the species we identified in the parks were the native white oak trees which is seen near the shell paving in the bottom left corner and also the common lilac which is often used for landscaping and black locust trees which are a non-native tree that is in the middle picture. Next is public open space. This term is used to include all unimproved public land, land bank property, and landscaping surrounding commercial buildings. Uh, the image in the top right hand corner is public open space that is used to help retain water. Some of the species you can see in that picture are the non-native black-eyed Susan and the native panic grass. And then lastly, we have private open space, which refers to the private residences in the South Washington Street study area and includes landscaped front, side, and backyards with grass and or a range of tree types and plantings. Uh, private open space in Nantucket is often landscaped with non-native or decorative species. This includes the lilies that are seen in the top right hand corner and the hydrangeas seen in the bottom left hand corner. Thank you um, for the presentation, Elizabeth. So I'm gonna very quickly walk us through, uh, not in great detail, our vulnerability assessment. Again, I'm happy to um, answer any questions about our um, assessment. Let's see. The image that you see here is along Francis Street during the January 4th, 2018 uh, storm surge uh, event. It was the second largest recorded flooding on record, just under four feet. Uh, water did extend all the way to uh, Union, but it was, done, it was in part because of uh, wave action and, and wind-driven uh, storm surge. We, of course, looked at uh, FEMA. What you're seeing here is a, um, 
the theme of the flood map, uh, looking specifically at our um, study area. And uh, FEMA, for example, with your, um, for your design flood elevation or your base flood elevation is recommending nine feet for the area. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that in terms of our approach, but we looked at tidal flooding, storm surge, and sea level rise specifically. I want to uh, uh, thank Chuck Larson. This is actually his slide, the next two. He did some really amazing analysis using our tide gauge uh, that's located in the harbor near the Steamship Authority. And we're looking rather closely at tidal flooding in terms of short term uh, recommendations. One thing I did want to point out is that, again, thank you, Chuck Larson, for this slide. The ones uh, uh, that are identified in the purple of the seven worst flooding events in Nantucket, seven of them have occurred since 2013. The um, October 1991 known name or perfect storm is still the largest on a record at 4.29 feet. But we also looked at a 100 year or 1% sort of flood events. Uh, and in our flood area, it kind of ranges from about eight to 11 feet. When it came to sea level rise, we used specifically the NOAA intermediate high projections. And I'm gonna zoom in on the built areas of our study area. You can see here the kind of expansion with this particular um, uh, scenario, the expansion of the creeks over time. This is zooming in on 2030. You can see this is the next 10 years that a lot of the, what's known as the South Beach area and a lot of the beach coastline will be impacted as well as the kind of expansion and encroachment of the um, creeks on the Southeast portion of the study area. We chose 2030, 2060, and 2100. It's a little different than the town's coastal resilience plan that will be um, developed over the next year. They had proposed looking at 2030, 2050, 2100. But what we found in looking in more detail uh, at 2050 is that it's somewhere between 2050 and 2060 when Washington Street is regularly underwater twice a day by tidal flooding. You can also see with this that there is this kind of lower lying area in the center of our site and that where the shipyard used to be and now the Great Harbor Yacht Club because it had been built up over time becomes a sort of little island, if you will. By 2100 at this projection, we have water regularly covering Union Street. It does not mean, however, the building's first floors are underwater, but the majority of buildings, particularly on the harbor side, their basements will be uh, inundated. And just to remind you, these were from our first phase of the Resilient Nantucket study. Um, this is our study area shown here in Hatch. We did one visualization. The cottages here have now been subsequently removed and the road is being, widening, is being widened from South Washington to Francis. But this will give you uh, from 2019 to 2060, you can see is that there's a sort of tipping point that occurs between 2050 and 2060 where the inundation increases rather dramatically. So by 2060, this is what you're seeing is high tide, not a worst case high tide or best case high tide, but a sort of average high tide. So that's 4.4 uh, feet, which just to remind you is a little over the uh, no name or perfect storm uh, surge event. In 2080, you've got 6.4 feet and you can see water is really basically up to Union. And then again, by 2100 at eight feet, which is also, by the way, a lot of the study areas, 100 year or 1% flood event is about an eight feet storm surge as well. And then we are showing, uh, this is a, a, along uh, Coffin Street. So I'm going to be the first to sort of introduce, and then the students will, will, will talk a little bit more about the built and natural environment. But the, the strategy that we've developed for the South Washington Street area adheres to, again, kind of best practices. The idea of resilience being the ability of the built and natural environment to keep adapting to existing and emerging threats such as coastal hazards. And there are three sort of broad strategies that we looked at, protect, accommodate, and retreat. Um, protection is both um, uh, green and gray, as they say, sort of infrastructure um, used to sort of keep the water at bay. I think one of the more well-known internationally is the, the Mose floodgate project in Venice, Italy, which has just been coming online over the last 
year or so. So these are large gates that are that are lifted during uh, anticipated uh, storm events from the Adriatic moving into the lagoon. We had many presentations and looked at many precedents, which we won't get to talk about in detail today, but we had a really excellent presentation from Charleston, which has been a leader in, the, in looking at the elevation of historic buildings. But one proposal that the Corps of Engineers is looking at is building a flood wall around the battery. And you can see here an engineer's rendering of this flood wall and how it will sort of cut off um, the views. Um, but just to remind everyone, we, we have protection measures already underway here in uh, and to get one of the more well-known being the Sconset Bluffs and the dramatic erosion that's occurred there over the last couple of decades. And what you see in the bottom left corner is the installation of the, geotex the geotextile tubes to help stabilize or to, to attempt to stabilize the, uh, the cliff. When it comes to um, accommodation, uh, there are sort of three broad approaches, dry flood proofing, which is Often, uh, a very simply, you see like sandbags at the doors or door dams to keep water out of buildings. There's wet flood proofing, which is to design buildings to allow them to flood. This is Tobias uh, Glidden and some students last year. Um, Tobias has actually taken his building um, near Broad Street and uh, uh, rehabilitated it to allow it to sort of flood and be easily recovered. And then, of course, we have the elevation of buildings, and that's occurring quite often. Quite a few buildings have already been lifted in our study area, including one of the older buildings in the study area, 57 Union, which was lifted a few years ago. I think it's about the, the lifting of the buildings in our study area sort of ranged from a little over four feet to about six feet. And then just recently approved next to the Great Harbor Yacht Club is 92 Washington Street, which is a nine foot elevation. Again, that's using the sort of FEMA recommendation. So, uh, it is occurring and part of our sort of challenge here was to look more holistically at how we might kind of regulate the elevating of uh, existing and new buildings. And of course, there's a retreat and we've seen that happening on Nantucket, a house that was moved last year and I think the large New York Times profile in 2007, the St. Kitty Lighthouse was moved back and it's occurring more and more regularly I think, on the island. So in terms of our uh, South Washington Street uh, resilience and adaptation area, we've, we're proposing, at least conceptually, what we're calling a linear systems approach. So first of all, we're proposing a living shoreline in the South Washington, Washington Street, or South Beach, uh, Washington Street Beach area. It could also, depending, uh, extend down you know, into the creeks. And we'll talk a little bit more about living shorelines. There's an existing, um, uh, harbor shoreline. Many of those buildings are owned by um, the land bank and managed by them, but there's also town and Nantucket property. And I think the goal and strategy there is to kind of open up that view. So there may be opportunities and tr to uh, adapt uh, that linear system, the, the shoreline to help with both uh, short-term storm surge and longer-term resilience. And then the two largest linear systems is from Washington to Union. Uh, and then Union Street itself. So there are four primary linear systems. And within those linear systems, I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in here. That's the larger uh, view. So what we're talking about here is, again, a living shoreline, modifications to the existing shoreline over time. You see Washington Street, which in 2030, this is what we're looking at, will remain in place. And then we're we've identified at least two what we're calling adaptation opportunity zones. So this might be areas such as the municipal parking lot and finance building and pocket park home by the town, but as well as the Murray Mitchell um, uh, property could be looked at for sort of new development and helping propose a kind of new architecture based on historic precedent. And then with the 2060, we're talking about expanding that adaptation opportunity zone and reimagining the town pier, but hopefully allowing it to remain in this location. By, uh, by 2060, Washington Street is gone. It's regularly underwater. And so the saltwater marsh and the uh, living shoreline that's created is now extending well into the study area even into this uh, Washington Street to Union Street zone. 
And then you can see we had, uh, I think there's a real opportunity. One of the largest private property owners is the Great Harbor Yacht Club. It is on relatively high ground, as I mentioned, and there may be an opportunity for the club to kind of set a, a, an example, if you will, in the redevelopment of their property. And then, and then Union Street would be the last area to be adapted. Tracy, are you? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Marty. Hello, everyone. My name is Tracy Tamrakar. I'm a first year master's student in historic preservation. And I'm going to present built environment section with a focus on guidelines on flood adaptations for rehabilitating historic buildings. The guidelines on the flood adaptation for rehabilitating historic buildings is the first attempt on looking at the guidelines on a federal level, speci specifically for historic buildings. Previously, it had only been uh, talking about new constructions. Uh, so to have this is very significant. As I went through the adaptation and modeling, we have relied on this document in order to inform the decisions for consideration. And we are still in the process of making these guidelines specific to Nantucket. So, we looked at several precedents and collected some of the examples. First, we have wet flood proofing. Wet flood proofing is an adaptive measure for flooding, where flood water is allowed to enter enclosed areas of a building in a way that the damage to the structure and its contents are minimized. For a successful wet flood proofing, it is important to ensure that the flood waters inside the home uh, rise and fall at the same rate as flood waters outside the home. This can be achieved by restoring historic foundation vents and also adding new hydrostatic vent, vents that are compatible with historic architecture. The other examples of wet flood proofing are elevating utilities and HVAC units and also elevating electrical outlets. Introduction of permeable surfaces and rain gardens also help in groundwater recharge and faster flood recovery. The current policy uh, does not allow wet flood proofing to be applied to residential structures, but this is something that we believe should be considered as a necessary change. Second, we have elevate. Elevating is raising a structure to a place to place the lowest floor le level at or above the designated design flood level elevation on, a, on an extended support or fill. Houses or buildings can be elevated in different ways, such as elevate over landfill or an extended perimeter walls or columns or piers. When elevate, while elevating any building, its structural integrity is very important. So a building should be properly assessed for structural deficiencies and repaired prior to elevating. Also, while introducing a new foundation, it is highly recommended to salvage and reuse historic materials. While trying to retain or have minimal alteration in the character of the neighborhood, uh, a lot of attention needs to be paid to architectural treatment and landscaping of these foundations with increased heights. And the other points to, to be considered while elevating are retaining historic access locations and elevating later additions along with the primary building. In Nantucket, the only adaptive me measure that is allowed for residential structure is eleva elevation, referring to the Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan published in 2019. On this and the upcoming slides, we have two examples from different two different linear systems that has been discussed previously, one from the uh, Washington Street to Union Street linear system and the other from uh, Union Street linear system. Not only that these two examples are different in scale and location, but the adaptation measures are also occurring at two different time frames or dates. Here we have uh, first Fayette Street, it lies in Washington to Union Street linear system. The style of the house is typical Nantucket with three bays constructed circa 1850 and is used as private residence. You can see a historic photo of it here in 1890s and, and compare with the one standing today. The second floor has been added. Uh, the roof was redone uh, 
dormer is added and the chimney was, uh, the position of chimney has been changed. Our goal with the considerations is to keep, keep people and the place they love as long as possible. So here we are trying to find a way to live with water and to still live in historic area and to live in historic homes. When looking at wet flood proofing considerations, uh, that is why we're suggesting adding these vents on the foundations that you can see in the orange so that the water can move through without causing any damage which would otherwise happen due to water pressure. We also should look at the permeable surfaces and lawns and rain gardens to manage water and move it away from the building so that it does not co cause as much damage. All these points here we are doing is to mitigate that damage. This eleva elevating adaptation strategy is for 2060 when the area gets regularly flooded. The first floor level should be elevated to design flood levels and this image shows various considerations to be taken while elevating. In contrast to previous strategies, we have added plans that help disguise the elevation. It, it, it not only hiding the foundation height and the vents from the, what, from the red flood proofing in more natural way to help visual mitigation, but it also helps in water management. Elevation, while it is more expensive and more invasive, it is more long-term than red flood proofing. Uh, the next example is 30th Union Street. It lies in Union Street linear system. It is a typical Nantucket house with three bays, constructed in 1804 and also used as a private residence. The picture on the left is a photo from 1880s that shows the building back in time and how it has evolved till today. The building faces flood event at a later date due to topography. It sits on a higher ground. Therefore, uh, unlike when we are already elevating first for it in 2060, we are only recommending flood, wet flood proofing here as it is at less risk during that time. The considerations are similar to what we have discussed earlier. We chose this house on Union Street particularly as it has been modified a lot over time and there are a lot of uh, additional masters on the rear. So we are proposing that any modifications that remain should also be lifted. While elevating these structures, we, are, we also recommend to still have flood vents so that they help in maintaining water pressure in any flood event and backyards and lawns to be turned to rain gardens with native species to help in mitigating water and effects of flood events. So in terms of um, addressing this issue of a, a common uh, design flood elevation height, uh, what we're exploring is the idea of creating a kind of uh, zero datum point at the corner of Francis Street and uh, Union Street. We're looking at the Union Street linear system uh, and then kind of working backwards, if you will, towards the shore. So from there, basically at that elevation uh, point, which is a little over five feet above sea level, we're proposing establishing a common design flood elevation datum. It would be about seven feet at that corner. But as you can see from this diagram from Union and uh, Francis Street, seven feet at this corner, but the datum is continuous. So as you move toward the shoreline and the elevation is dropping, by the time that you get to um, the cottages at NISDA, the ones that remain, you're not at 7.25 feet, but you're closer to an eight foot uh, elevation. But you can see the first floor level is consistent and the buildings, of course, their, their overall form and their individual heights are maintained. The same thing looking at meter, as you're moving uh, towards town in Washington, you actually have an elevation increase. So here you're talking about on Union Street at meter less than a seven foot uh, elevation. And then towards the water in Washington Street, you're talking about closer to a nine foot elevation. 
and we looked at each one of them, or at least in the process of looking at each individual uh, streetscape. Again, FEMA's recommendation, at least in part, is nine feet, and we're proposing less than that with an idea that it's not just elevation, but it's a combination, an integrated approach to both elevating and uh, wet proofing first floor. And part of that idea is if you look at the blue diagram here is in the future, if there was a kind of raised platform system or another way of accessing the streets, it can sort of follow um, this pattern. So again, a continuous uh, uh, design flood elevation. Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian Hippel. I'm a master's student in landscape architecture at the University of Florida and I'll be uh, presenting some of our adaptation strategies for the natural environment. So uh, starting to the south in the creeks area, uh, one of the more salt marsh dominated ecosystems in our site. Um, some of our proposals would be to enhance the eelgrass beds and dune beach um, in the front of the creek mouths to kind of stabilize and protect the shoreline, but also um, enhance and increase the ecological value of some of these associated ecosystems. Uh, we'd want to restore some of the natural hydrology and uh, the sedimentation resume of the marsh to areas that have been impacted by the mosquito ditching. Um, to allow for those marshes to raise with sea levels. Um, one of the biggest proposals would be to remove the bike path and berm to restore the natural hydrology to this area um, and consider replacing it with a low impact boardwalk um, and a system of trails and boardwalks, such as the one to the right, such as the image to the right, um, to allow uh, educational benefits of this area and increase recreational value in this area. Um, we'd want to minimize hardened shoreline edges of commercial properties and um, residential properties along the creeks to allow for natural salt marsh migration um, over time and allow for migration of these ecosystems upland. Um, and then some of the higher elevations leading down to the creeks area, we'd want to implement low impact design stormwater management strategies, um, such as the bioswell to the right, um, possibly along Union Street and also remove any invasive plant species uh, upland that could migrate potentially down to the creeks area and disturb the natural environments there. Along the harbor, we're proposing a living shoreline. A living shoreline by de definition is a shoreline erosion control management practice, which also restores, enhances, maintains, or creates natural coastal or riparian habitat functions and processes. Um, some quick benefits of living shorelines are they reduce carbon gas emission in our environments. Um, they absorb wave energy and wave, uh, decrease wave attenuation, um, as well as they soften the shoreline and improve ecological conditions along these shorelines tremendously. So along Washington Street, the Harbor Shoreline, um, we're proposing to renaturalize and create more resilient design landscapes, such as reduce, uh, or proposing more natural uh, native salt tolerant plants to withstand um, major storm events, such as the far right um, image is an idea of how we propose for this landscape to transition back to. Uh, we propose improving stormwater management practices along Washington Street to cleanse water entering the harbor, as well as um, reduce flooding events due to large storm events uh, that coincide with high tides. And then we also um, propose to implement site-specific living shoreline solutions, such as uh, enhanced dunes, um, oyster big waters and expanding the salt marsh in this area to decrease wave attenuation. Along the public parks of Francis Street, we propose to create wetland pocket parks that could store some of the stormwater coming off of Washington Street and uh, streets uphill of this area to um, collect and absorb water and cleanse water that we release to the harbor. 
Um, this could also act in activating these spaces and improving recreational value of these spaces, um, as well as educational benefits um, to interpret sea level rise and resilience measures and educate the community on these issues. All right, here we have outlined some examples of community engagement initiatives that could promote placemaking and create a local dialogue about climate change. So a public and private partnership would be essential and would include key stakeholders and community um, institutions like the Artists Association of Nantucket and Acclimate. Um, in order to preserve the heritage of the artists and residents, um, it would be interesting to invite those artists to create a, um, an art installation and it would capitalize on a resident and island-wide um, engagement. So um, Washington Street Transformed is a working title for a digital community uh, photo project uh, where we provide a space for visitors and residents, young and old, to contextualize the visual changes to Nantucket's landscape. Um, by using old photographs and paintings, participants can take a glimpse at the past, but also help inform the future of Nant Nantucket's view, um, view, view sheds. Um, we could expand upon the solography exhibit and concept uh, created by the Artists Association and the creation of a scavenger hunt for visual differences in the landscape um, could create an opportunity for um, a reimagining of what the district might look like in the future and also provide an exercise in climate change engagement. Next, we have examples of how other communities around the world have visualized sea level rise with art, um, taking special note of the lines um, in Scotland and the Underwater Homeowners Association in Miami. Um, while they're both quite different in terms of scale, uh, they could be used to inform projects for Nantucket in the short term and then potentially the long term. And with our adaptation opportunity zones, we looked specifically at what we're calling zone A as a potential for um, a demonstration project. And that includes, well, I'll let Bob Miklos hand it over to him to explain. Thank you, Marty. Uh, this has been um, a, a great opportunity for myself and my colleagues at Design Lab to participate uh, in this uh, uh, great initiative uh, for the PIN Studio. Just a little background on myself. Um, a 30-year weekend and summer resident of Nantucket. Uh, my practice, Design Lab Architects, is in Boston. We focus uh, exclusively on uh, educational arts, cultural, and civic clients. A uh, majority of our projects work with buildings of legacy, but we're combining that with approaches to sustainability and resilience. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, we had the opportunity in uh, February of um, uh, 2019 to update uh, Mariah Mitchell's uh, focus on their 33 Washington Street uh, location. They've been very successful with a small aquarium building on the harbor, uh, acquired some years ago, 33 Washington Street, and an additional parcel that can provide them potentially with a much stronger presence on Washington Street. So we chose that as our kind of demonstration area for the, the analysis and recommendations that came out of this study. Uh, so I, I think you all know uh, quite a lot about the history of Mariah Mitchell and her important influence on the island. Uh, and the, uh, the association has been uh, an ex outstanding uh, educator and uh, uh, and uh, supporter of the environment on Nantucket. And uh, the association views, as, views Nantucket very much as a laboratory given the different uh, conditions uh, in the sea, land, and the, and the area in between. And it gives them an opportunity uh, <clears throat> to engage in the sky, sea, and land all together. 
Um, so right now, uh, there's a small 600 square foot building, which we believe was a former uh, train depot on Washington Street, uh, right on the harbor where they've uh, been doing active programming that's very popular throughout the summer. Um, the 33 Washington Street parcel is uh, directly across from this on Washington Street. It's the uh, uh, former uh, Kerr School of Arts. So there's a number of buildings there, some more recent, some older. You can see in the lower right hand, uh, the, the main building of the Kerr School it has a beautiful hall within. And there are actually uh, two studio buildings um, that remain and then a more recent house. So back in uh, 2019, my, um, my colleagues at Design Lab, my partner Kelly um, Haig and I, uh, took a look at the potential of that site. And we went, uh, just as we're doing here today, back to look at the history of this site um, in Washington Street. And the upper left is actually a historic photo uh, from the creeks, but pretty much at, at South Beach and Washington Street. So we looked at the character of that waterfront uh, to find inspiration for what, uh, what we might do on that site. I think interesting is the lower right-hand photo. Um, uh, it's a postcard. Uh, and what was typical all throughout the harbor and, and in this area, there were a number of floating uh, docks which uh, helped facilitate uh, fishing and marine activities um, and that might be an opportunity uh, for Mariah Mitchell to, um, uh, to accommodate uh, programs there. So just very quickly, these were uh, two of a series of concept, uh, that concept uh, uh, projects that we developed uh, back in February 2019. But the whole idea here, this and on the left-hand side of each of these models is Washington Street, was to elevate uh, the entire complex on a deck at, at uh, plus eight feet from, uh, from sea level, uh, where there were, would be a whole series of activities uh, utilizing both the existing structures and additional structures uh, where they could expand their aquarium program, but also showcase their natural history uh, components and provide a kind of science hall where um, they could sponsor symposiums, special events, uh, and uh, even uh, in earned income activities. Uh, so these two uh, sketches show some of that work at the time. On the left is the inside of the Kerr building and the right uh, the idea of a, a new science hall, which would be a pier-like building, again, on a deck. So with this study, we had the good fortune of uh, leading our uh, built environment team. So with uh, students Sebastian, Ina, Charisti, and my colleagues at Design Lab, Kelly and Rashida, along with the whole University of Florida team, uh, we began to speculate at what might be uh, an initial project that would build on the research and strategies we developed in this PIN studio. So here you see a Google aerial um, of this section of uh, Washington Street, uh, the Mariah Mitchell site. If you could outline that with a cursor, please, Marty. Uh, that's the 33 Washington Street parcel. And then across the street, uh, the little, the small little shed, which you all know, uh, is um, uh, is the Mariah Mitchell Aquarium, and and most of that land that we see on the harbor, as uh, was pointed out earlier, is land bank or town owned land. Um, that's the uh, town pier building uh, where the cursor is now. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, our, our kind of subject area, you see the outline there, uh, was to look at just this section of Washington Street to see what a potential uh, short-term transformation adaptation might be. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, 
the idea of returning the waterfront to a uh, saltwater marsh, a condition we're, we're pretty convinced existed uh, before development along there was, was an idea that was embraced uh, by a lot of our advisors and partners, such as uh, Nantucket Conservation Foundation and folks from the land bank. But that might incorporate some beaches, but remove bulk, bulkheads. But the idea would be to make um, a living landscape that's much more resilient to sea level rise and storm uh, would, would um, accommodate uh, some of the wave action and provide storage. So then opposite uh, Washington Street, um, there is existing right now in the neighboring property to Mariah Mitchell, a uh, freshwater wetland that we think uh, recently occurred probably as a result of past storms and flooding. Uh, as many of you know, the front yard of Mariah Mitchell is wet frequently uh, because it's at a lower elevation. Uh, so there is standing water there frequently. Then a little further south uh, with the town finance building, a large park was created, which is a great amenity. So we see the potential of a band of freshwater uh, marshes and saltwater marshes on this area of um, Washington Street, which would be almost 30% uh, of, of that area um, immersed now in more of a green landscape. Within town parking, there's, a, there's an opportunity to convert paving to something permeable and to interweave that with rain gardens uh, which would take some of the runoff and filter it. And along the back edge, we even um, uh, began to speculate about making that edge a rain garden, which could integrate with the backyards of many of the houses on Union Street. Uh, so we have um, a much more resilient landscape in this zone and one that ac actually provides more protection uh, from storms uh, particularly to the Union Street uh, properties. Next slide, please. So um, a primary focus of this initial Mariah Mitchell initiative would be creating uh, our own uh, wet garden, uh, freshwater landscape. And that would be a dynamic uh, feature. Uh, we learned a lot in the, in the various presentations about the diversity of plant material that can thrive in these landscapes and, and the idea to create a plant community uh, that could uh, regenerate itself and sustain itself. So the, the idea of making a major focus of this Mariah Mitchell initiative, a large wetlands garden, it could be a kind of experimental tool and demonstrate demonstration tool, uh, a dynamic landscape that changes through the seasons and through the storms, uh, but is resilient and, and, and is a kind of teaching uh, component of um, what can occur in this landscape. So here you see an enlargement of the uh, Mariah Mitchell 33 Washington Street uh, property. So the, the large gray building is the former Kerr School uh, which Mariah Mitchell has been using. It has like a large hall on the first floor. It is without foundations. Um, it's susceptible to flooding. Uh, so we show in this scenario, this large new um, uh, freshwater marsh uh, that would occupy the majority of the front yard, but then uh, woven around it is our first demonstration of an elevated uh, platform or deck. So we imagined an outdoor amphitheater, uh, outdoor teaching classroom, if you will, that's about plus six above uh, street level, uh, achieving, uh, achieving uh, an ultimate uh, elevation of uh, almost eight feet above sea level. To arrive at that elevation, we wove a, a, a gently sloping walk, one in 20, uh, a ramp without uh, handrails and all of that, that meanders through the garden to take you to that elevation and to a view 
over Washington Street to the harbor. At a midpoint of that walk, we thought we would establish a milestone marker um, that uh, acknowledged the no-name storm, and that could be a small seating area or demonstration area along Washington Street. To kind of anchor our new campus, we brought one of the small Kerr studio buildings to the edge, and that kind of complements uh, the scale of the current um, uh, Mariah Mitchell uh, Aquarium building across the way uh, to give a kind of scale and character to this district. So in doing that, um, my partner Kelly went back and took a look at some of our previous strategies uh, for the future expansion of uh, the Mariah Mitchell Science Center on this site, just to make sure that any, any of these initial ideas or strategies uh, would not preclude uh, future development in the back. So you hear, see here, again, a large elevated deck with an outdoor um, tide pool, touch tank, uh, a, an aquarium, another outdoor classroom, uh, and a science hall, and the potential for a large roof walk as both a demonstration area, a place where um, uh, stargazing uh, can occur in, a, in uh, an expanded view to the harbor. S so here's um, the Kerr building from Washington Street as, uh, as we travel uh, away from town. Uh, so you can see there's a considerable amount of front lawn here. And on the right is the neighbor's property that's, uh, um, that has developed into a very interesting uh, wetlands condition. So the next slide shows uh, our initial vision. You see uh, in the foreground, the corner of uh, Washington Street, the, the smallest Kerr studio moved forward. Um, those two buildings and the deck beyond surround this large uh, new landscape. Again, a dynamic um, uh, wetlands garden with uh, changing plants, changing color throughout the season. It may sometimes be wet, it's some, it may uh, alternatively be dry depending on the seasons. And the elevated deck provides not only a view to the harbor but an outdoor uh, demonstration and gathering area. And we borrowed from the nautical uh, traditions of Nantucket to put a large sail uh, over this uh, elevated deck uh, to, um, uh, to pr protect the outdoor activity. Uh, this is the view from the 33 Washington Street uh, <clears throat> property right now, and we're looking right into the harbor, kind of unobstructed view, because all of that, all of the space on the other side is belong, does belong to the land bank, and we see the uh, dock master building uh, uh, beyond um, uh, commercial war. And to the left across the street, you see the small uh, current uh, Mariah Mitchell Aquarium building. So from the elevated deck, um, we're looking into uh, this wetland garden and you can see uh, the pattern of the gently sloping ramp as it, as, as it brings you from street level up to this elevated view of the harbor and ultimately uh, to this outdoor classroom and amphitheater, uh, which could be a place just for, uh, as a park for casual congregating or it, it could um, support the many programs of Mariah Mitchell and, and actually uh, special events as well. Uh, so again, this is the uh, diagram of the uh, kind of progression of salt, saltwater marsh to wetland to rain garden along Washington Street. And we dropped in here um, the plan, kind of aerial plan of the uh, full Mariah Mitchell uh, Science Center concept. Uh, the next slide. Uh, speculates on a redevelopment of the town property should the finance building move and the parking be put to 
um, a different use. And one of the things we know on Nantucket that a, a great challenge is providing housing for the workforce. That would be medical and hospital workers, educators, the hospitality and retail industry, as well as seniors and even artists. So we imagined in this new area which embraces sea level rise and uh, a wet environment of continuing the idea of the wet marsh through that, but developing a bit village of cottages, possibly only a story or a story and a half, that are combined on elevated decks. Uh, and throughout that village, there may be a number of community resources, a community room, an education building, uh, art studio area, maybe even a, a wellness and fitness center. Um, so just a, a placeholder, but here are a few uh, precedents, one from the Marlboro School in Vermont and one from uh, the very famous Deer Island Art School in Maine, which is uh, coastal. Um, but these are both uh, an idea of small co cottages uh, that e exist um, with, with elevated platforms in some conditions, but it creates a whole uh, community uh, around the deck. So just, uh, just a, um, uh, a possibility for uh, that property uh, to accommodate a, a number of issues uh, that could, could help the town. Thank you, Bob. Um, just in terms of our next uh, steps, um, we're going to spend uh, the next few months refining our resilience and adaptation area strategy and the linear system strategy um, that we discussed today um, with input from our presentation as well as circulating a draft report to advisors and others. Um, we'll repeat a modified version of this presentation as part of the Nantucket Preservation Trust Rescuing History Symposium slated for September 16th through the 17th online. Um, further development of a demonstration project um, and we will be developed or um, getting a cost estimate to see, you know, how feasible uh, the demonstration project is. Uh, we hope to have that ready around the 1st of October, but we'll be refinalizing our report through the, our fall semester. Um, I think for PIN 2021, we're considering additional digital documentation of the study area and streetscape or uh, specific um, resilience projects at Union, Fayette, and Meter. And I think the interesting thing is that kind of continuity and change <laughs> Um, the program has changed a lot over years, but some of the core principles, including that holistic approach, the historic built environment remains. And so going from 1969, the Orange Street study above to, to the current day and us using this digital documentation and other technologies. Um, you know, Nantucket, those of you who know me uh, know that I'm very interested in the middle of the 20th century and what I often call the Bainiki period and the transformation and redevelopment of Nantucket through the lens of preservation. Our um, last year of the 300 buildings, I think people were surprised to learn that 75% of those, almost 75%, were built in the 20th century and over 50% of them were built after World War II. So the idea that Nantucket is a whaling village is a little bit of a misnomer. It really is a product of the middle of the 20th century when there was a major kind of transformation. And we are now, what we're doing this summer and into the fall is preparing for yet another major transformation as the town addresses issues of climate change and sea level rise. But I wanted to end on a sort of positive note. This is the dreamland or the, you know, the original uh, what was the Quaker meeting house that had been converted to a theater being floated across the harbor from Brant Point to its current location. And I think the idea I really want to leave you with is that Nantucket has always been a resilient community. It's always been a creative and innovative community. And despite this challenge that lies ahead, I think that working together these types of multidisciplinary approaches and engaging the, ex the amazing expertise that we have on the island and the amazing expertise that we can bring from off the island that we will uh, envision and reimagine a new future for Nantucket. So I'd like to thank all the students and Bob and Mike and my other colleagues and a huge thank you also to 
remain Nantucket for their support of our um, efforts. And with that, I will um, open the floor for questions. Or comments or... <laughs> I think you sh I could share too, I'm pleased to, to note there are nearly 50 people watching this uh, this morning, which is a great turnout. I appreciate that. If you'd like, you can type questions in the chat. And if you are having trouble coming off mute, just um, raise your hand and we can try and help. So. Well, I just, can you hear me? I'd just like to say thank you to the study team because First of all, it was very impressive how much you were able to understand this site without being here. So thank you to all those students who have obviously spent many, many hours in front of their screens um, this summer, appreciating all the complexity of this site without being able to walk it. Um, I hope at some point you'll be able to come here and see it. And I just think that this is very exciting for Mariah Mitchell to think about how we might play a role in this whole area in terms of um, what we've always done, what our mission is, and that's educating the public about what is around them. So I think that this is a fantastic opportunity for us to do more of that. Um, I'd like to thank Marty and, and the whole team and, and Bob for all of the time that he has already donated, um, and, you know, working with our organization pro bono to, to help us eventually do something very transformative down by the harbor. So thank you all. Right, I don't know if you want to read the chat or if you want me to just go off reading. Uh, you, can, you can read the questions if you want. Okay, so um, our first question is from Lisa Craig asking um, if we'll be able in the future to look at economics. Um, that's certainly one of our recommendations. Lisa, I think uh, both economic impact as well as the, um, the kind of financing that would be needed for some of these adaptation opportunity zone ideas if that's what you're asking for. So um, I think in the limited amount of time we have to wrap up this study, it'll be a recommendation for a next phase. Yeah, she, she followed up a later um, particular interest in heritage tourism. And then- Yeah, I think it's, I, I think using that kind of St. Augustine model, I know the work that you've done there engaging place economics um, and Donovan Ripcombe, I think that would be a great idea for Nantucket. Also in the chat, we have Mary Kay Judy asking, what has been the response of the public and property owners that you have encountered during field work? Well, they, they, I wasn't having casual conversations about the idea of lifting people's buildings, but uh, so it'd be interesting to see if there are any property owners online. We did have an interesting um, conversation with the representative of the Great Harbor Yacht Club. And so I hope that, um, that this report, once it's finalized, will be wide, more widely circulated. And the idea of returning back to the study area and looking at specific streetscapes, hopefully, once we're through this pandemic and we're able to hold kind of workshops and charrettes, that would be the idea for next year. Our next question is from Mary Longacre asking, has Penn identified any buildings constructed in the 20th century as top candidates for historic preservation? Uh, I have a laundry list I could give you. I think I think Nantucket needs to look a little more closely at its recent past. And um, our National Historic Landmark update actually extended the period of significance into the 70s to when the island itself became, the entire island became a landmark district. And I think a lot of the buildings that were done during that, again, that Beinecke era and the kind of redevelopment, it's time to, it's time to look closely at those as being contributing buildings. And then last, what we have in chat right now is Arlene, oh, hold on. Um, uh, Arlene Flux kind of giving a comment saying she has appreciation for the way Penn has evolved to address contemporary and future issues and for the creativity and quality of the program's work. Yeah, thank you, Arlene. I feel like one of the reasons this program has been a, a success is because we, in terms of that, uh, 
uh, community-based or public-private partnership. Penn, Penn has never, at least to my knowledge, we've never come in the University of Florida and said, here's what the problem is. We've listened very closely to our colleagues on the island and our other partners, and we help define the problem sometimes. And then we offer, like today, maybe solutions that some of them are viable and maybe some of them are more kind of uh, envisioning what could happen. But I, I do think that's one of the uh, reasons this program has succeeded. And finally, as of now, I have a few questions about sharing this presentation and the slides. Um, okay. I can tell you that I have recorded today, and if we're able, I, this presentation is around 170 slides, so it's very a large file. Um, the recording, I hope to be able to make it available on our webpage, dcp.ufl.edu forward slash historic preservation, um, and I can share that link once I get everything set up. So. And the other thing that Clarissa and I have discussed, but not recently, but early on, is doing a story map, which is a great way. It's an ESRI ArcGIS product. So I think we'll be able to turn this into a pretty easily accessible online. But I, I think there's a lot of vetting and a lot of conversations, like with Chuck, I see you down there, the town that probably needs to occur before we, we put it out there <laughs> in a more permanent way. Mary Kay followed up also really interesting to see the changes over time through the work of local artists in addition to historic photos. I, you know, I thank Lisa Craig, who increasingly since I've been working with Lisa over the last few years has talked more and more about this cultural landscape approach and I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer that that's a, a great way of approaching uh, resilience and I think the visual arts piece uh, could be really significant in redeveloping the area and, and communicating the, the uh, message. That's all I have for now. Well, I'm happy. I think most of you, it's easy to find me. It's Morris Hilton uh, at ufl.edu, but it's easy to um, search for me. I'm sure Bob and I uh, could also, it's easy to find Bob online. We're happy to have individual conversations or, you know, email exchange or whatever, um, if you have ideas or further comments. Again, we'll be doing the rounds with our partners, including the, the town of Nantucket and the Nantucket Land Bank, as well as Nantucket Conservation Foundation and then the Lori Nature Foundation. Everyone involved, well, Mariah Mitchell, uh, we'd love to have, you know, some more detailed input once a draft report's generated. Anything else, Clarissa? Nothing from the chat, but if anyone wants to come up with you, you are um, more than welcome. I'm afraid to press the button, unmute all, so you can go forward. <laughs> well, again, I just, I want to thank, you know, uh, the Osceola Foundation. I want to thank Remain Nantucket. And uh, I just, I can't say, I think all the students who were so engaged, even though they couldn't be here, and I think did a tremendous job and all of the researchers, Clarissa did a great job coordinating. Kim was our policy and guidelines person. Uh, Sujin Kim's on here, I think at least Chin. We had some great research team. And I can't say enough, I hope the island of Nantucket knows what a treasure they have with Bob Miklos and the time and energy that he puts in volunteering a lot of time, not only for the Mariah Mitchell Association, but for the Artists Association and the Nantucket Historical Association. And it's just been a real pleasure, uh, Bob and I, have I don't think we've ever done anything like this before, either one of us. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, and I just hope that we leave you with this being very uh, optimistic. Those of you who saw my presentation last year, I ended up in tears, so I tried not to do that this time. Uh, but I, I think that um, uh, while there's not exactly any one solution, I think that there are lots of opportunities that are going to arise through this lens of resilience and addressing sea level rise. So thank you all so much. Two years away from 50, mark your calendars. <laughs> all right, we're gonna sign off then. Thank you, Clarissa, for operating. <laughs>